who is going to carry out the transformations that would make a permanent revolution a reality in countries like Egypt and Tunisia. cost so far and how much do you think it's going to cost before it's over? And he said I have no idea. <laughs> and Pax Man pressed him in that Paxonian way, he must have some idea, he gave us a ballpark or figure. He said no, he says I don't think these figures have been produced yet. He says they will be produced eventually over the next couple of weeks and then we'll be able to put a figure on it. However he said, you know, uh, uh, in case any taxpayers were listening, you know, uh, he said he wanted to assure everybody that whatever the figure for the cost in the past, and whatever the projected figure for the cost of the war in the future, it would be provided, if necessary, from the Treasury Reserve. That's the money put away for a rainy day in the future. We'll lay that and pay for that, whatever it takes. Now, when was the last time you heard a minister of any party go on the television and say that whatever it would take to solve the problem of fuel poverty among pensioners <laughs> or hiring a sufficient number of classroom assistants to aid and assist children with disabilities or to keep all the libraries open, that whatever it took, rest assured, the money will be provided no matter what. Never have I heard that. And another, that's an illustration of the way in which the doctrine of humanitarian intervention has become a sort of imperative element in the conventional wisdom uh, of the day. And there's scarcely any debate about this. I mean, in the days after I heard Higgs, I, I vaguely hope that we find an editorial in the Guardian or the Independent or somebody on television, a left-wing Labour uh, MP or some commentator with a reputation for mild radicalism on some discussion and program, drawing attention to this and saying at a time of scarcity, at a time of cutbacks in the public service, and sort of a, a, how could William Hague say such a thing? And to factor that into discussion of the acceptability and supportability sort of, of the action I, I, in Libya. Yet I don't know about the rest of you, I mean, I wasn't monitoring every single current affairs program on television or reading all the newspapers. So, if anybody has heard any discussion of that particular aspect of the Libyan war, come up and tell us about it. And I don't know of it. You know, and again, so it's not the, just the conventional wisdom of the establishment of the ruling class which holds that humanitarian intervention trumps all other considerations when it comes to the allocation of the national resources, of state resources. It's widespread right across the political spectrum, not just uh, in Britain, but in the United States and in other countries with an imperial past, even tiny imperial past, are long forgotten. It's absolutely part of the way you're expected to think. To think anything else is an unthinkable thought sort of, uh, in the type of discourse which uh, surrounds issues like the uh, attack upon Libya. The, uh, and of course, the United Nations Resolution itself, Resolution 1793, if I'm wrong about that, somebody will correct me, uh, I think it's 1793, Obama, sort of in defending the limited US involvement in it, is over and over again, sort of on television programs which I've been watching, and CNN, and Al Jazeera, and all the rest of it, returns all the time to the words of Res uh, Resolution 1973, which refers to 
sort of the intention to protect civilianized areas, we use the wording of the, uh, of the uh, resolution, there are, and civilian populations at imminent threat from the Gaddafi uh, regime. That's the reason he says we're protecting people. It's in the interest of the Libyan people themselves. We are not doing this to spread the might of the United States. We are doing this because we have a moral duty to the suffering peoples of the world. And insofar as there's, there is debate in the United States, and there is some debate, it is about whether this is a sufficient reason for the intervention. I was listening a couple of days ago to Richard Hatz. He now heads the, said the foreign affairs think tank, I forget the actual name of it, but he's well known in Ireland as a man who, for a time, sort of was the US administration's point man in relation to the conflict in the North. And became, he became very used to him, talking in an expansive and liberal way about the conflict day of the North. And here he was again, in an expansive and liberal way, and saying, you know, that the intervention in Libya raised a number of important points which would have to be thought about. Could the United States really intervene everywhere where evil appeared, where sort of were playing people, sort of were being oppressed and murdered? Could it really intervene everywhere? Did it have the resources? And if it couldn't intervene everywhere, how should, could, how should it choose the places in which it did intervene? So it was a long dissertation on this subject, and a very interesting topic it is. But what was really interesting about it is that no point in his a, a, a dialectical argument between these two points of view of intervention and non-intervention and the circumstances and occasions when it is justified. And no time did he admit the possibility that perhaps the United States was doing evil in the world. It was all other people who were doing evil. And the only question for the United States was where to intervene against which particular evil. Again, the notion that the Western powers are themselves involved in evil in the world and might even be the prime source of the evil being visited upon the plain people uh, of the Middle East and elsewhere. This again is an unthinkable thought sort of in the discourse and the conventional wisdom sort of which encloses all argument about these matters at the moment. Now, I want to, the first thing I want to say, or the second thing I want to say, whatever it is, it's, uh, I want to say that there's nothing new in this. Nothing new at all. It goes back a long way. It goes back to every class society and every war they have ever waged. I mean, they never get up before their people. Say, tell you what, we're displeased with rulers such and such over in Syria or whatever it is. So we're going to invade and kill a lot of people and stop him because we don't like the cut of his jib sort of, and he won't do his own and he insists on holding on to some of the resources of his country. So we're going to go and slaughter them. British imperialism never came before the people. And so on this continent of Africa seems to be teeming part of that with riches. The land seems to cover diamonds and coal and iron ore and all the rest of it. We're going to go and take it and slaughter anybody who tries to stop us. Please support us. <laughs> they never say that. They never say that. The very good reason is that an awful lot of the people, and they're neither daft nor evil themselves, the plain people of Britain and everywhere else, they're very unlikely to be supported for, presented to them in that way. They're very likely to rebel against them and organize marches and say withdraw and bring the boys home and all the rest of it. So that's not the way it's presented. And it's of vital importance to the ruling class of Britain as it is to the ruling classes of all other great or once great powers which are involved abroad sort of in wars and in the suppression of other peoples. It is vitally important that they are able to present these wars as being humanitarian interventions and not a war at all in order to maintain a supported hope. It is vitally important that they are able to limit and restrict permissible debate on the subject and the question of whether this is the right uh, place to intervene in, whether we can really sustain it, whether a different strategy might be uh, advisable, that, those are the limits of the debate which is permissible, and that's not because they simply want to, you know, sort of win an argument, or they want a, a, a fix, sort of a discussion so that the outcome can be predetermined. It is absolutely vital, they have to do it. They have to do it in order to justify in the minds and hearts of their own, so to speak, people, and they have to uh, present it in that way. I said it goes back a long way. It so happens I was leaving the Roman historian Hatchet's house just the other night, uh, as you would, uh, uh, 
in fact, I was in the shop in Charing Cross Road and I saw a penguin translation of Tacitus histories, and uh, it just struck me, I had never read Tacitus in English, so uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's true actually, I mean, I come, I was taught by the priest of St. Collins College in Derry, we get a good grounding in Latin and Greek, I recommend it, I really do, I recommend it, I think Latin and Greek should be brought back, I mean, optional subjects in all our I think it's Philistinism that they're not there. The most glorious thing about Latin and Greek is not particularly that they are sort of a transmission then back to Greece and Rome, sort of it helps us to understand where Western civilization and the degree of enlightenment that re-emerged in, uh, uh, in Europe at the time, sort of, of the Zorgio Mento, if I pronounced that uh, correctly. To understand all that, you have to understand Rome and Athens, you have to understand Latin and Greek. The other wonderful thing about Latin and Greek is it's of no use at all to industry. It's only of use in our education. But then it started on the transform. Well, the nature of the debate over the financing of our universities at the moment, you've got two bands of Philistines arguing over how to control third level education. Factor Latin and Greek in there, and you've expanded the argument. Wonder I don't know how I get on to throw yes, that's it. Tacitus, and I came to his, uh, uh, I recommend Tacitus to a wonderful writer, incidentally. But he, uh, he, he, he puts a lot of time into the year uh, 69, 70 AD, because there's an awful lot happening in the Roman Empire uh, at the time. And he's got a description of the armies of Titus Caesar arriving in the gates of Jerusalem, and uh, preparing to you know, attack and sack a, a Jerusalem, which in Tacitus' account was in a city of 600,000 people at the time, and even lying for a, a, a bit of exaggeration, but in Tacitus' part was an absolutely remarkable figure. This was a major city, even by a modern standards, and Titus uh, Caesar was intent not just on taking the city, but on putting the inhabitants to the sword, I mean, quite sort of a, a, an, an enterprise. And they had to justify this enterprise. So we didn't just say the Jews are a very recalcitrant people. They're very unbiddable. Sort of, we better deal with them, sort of, in order to secure this flank of our empire. What he said was that these are violent people. They are depraved. The whole, all, all other peoples in the region sort of need to be saved from these Jews. And he describes uh, all the, and he gives a list of all the peoples of the region who had, on his account, being Titus Oates' account, had been exterminated and enslaved by the Jews. This was a humanitarian intervention of a sort to save all these uh, 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 people. And I've been described all the sort of oppression that allegedly the Jewish people have been involved in in the area. It was on to say, the other practices of the Jews are all sinister and revolting. This is Titus Oates speaking. And have entrenched themselves by their very wickedness. They are wretches of the most abandoned sort, a most lascivious people. They have introduced the practice of circumcision to show that they are different from others and to facilitate the most unspeakable practices. <laughs> I know, you know, that's, that's, uh, they think that eternal life is granted to those who will die in battle or execution, and therefore in oppressing other people. They've got a religion which justifies them and promises them eternal life if they are killed in the course of doing it. Now, what does that remind you of? What does that remind you of? I mean, this is not what the Jewish people are saying. This is what Titus Oates is telling his troops. They believe in saying that for that reason, that these people present those sort of with a terrible problem. They don't care if they die when they're attacking us. And also, we've got to exterminate them for that uh, uh, reason as well. And begins uh, uh, end by saying, the Jewish people and Jewish belief is paradoxical and degraded. So here we had sort of all that time ago, you know, two millennia ago, we have really the doctrine of a humanitarian intervention being adduced in circumstances in which the guy adducing the doctrine was about, if he could, that may largely succeeded in slaughtering hundreds of thousands of people. And no doubt came away filled with sort of a moral sense of a mission well accomplished, sort of in the world, uh, a, a better place. And of course, greeted sort of with great celebrations and great honours when he returned to Rome, having accomplished this wonderful humanitarian uh, uh, operation uh, sort of in Judea. You see, if you go down through history, you see this coming up again and again. The humanitarian intervention and the use of it to justify wars and cruelty is not something which was invented by the United States in modern times. It's been running through wars every time a class society 
of the, the ruling class and a class divided society, launches a war abroad. The doctrine of humanitarian intervention kicks in. I mean, sort of, that description of what the Jewish people believed, sort of, in relation to their fate that they died, sort of, while killing other people, sort of, uh, uh, for their cause, I mean, sort of, that has got striking contemporary uh, uh, resonance. Sort of, and so has, I mean, the doctrine which motivated and which justified the Crusades. You know, the first crusade is against sort of the Cathars and the Albigensians and over them, which involved the suppression of the Languedoc and actively sort of rather in Jerusalem, in the town of Cahiers, or Cahiers or Cahir, part of in uh, southern France. And all sort of 6,000 people being herded into the church there, and the church burnt down on top of them. How would you justify a thing like that? How would you justify, you know, the stench of burning flesh drifting across the countryside? How could you believe? Sort of that that was a moral thing to do. Well, of course, it was because the Cathars in the south of France were allegedly involved in oppressing everybody else around them and trying to impose on them sort of an untrue and uh, perfidious religion. That was the justification given. Sort of, and those who uh, uh, sort of read a little about it will sort of know the famous quote of the Abbot of Cito sort of, as they set out of the crusading armies set out and somebody had the temerity to ask, he said, well, you know, you know, there's an awful lot of people who sort of down there who'll be standing in their path and when we get there, they may not be heretics at all and they may not have been involved sort of in all this cruel oppression of the surrounding area. What are we to do with them? How are we to tell the difference? And the Abbot of Sito says, kill them all. Let God sort them out. Collateral damage. Acceptable. So there it was in the Crusades, and there it is right through sort of history. Sort of, and at the time, sort of, they could go through it almost century by century, right to back to the Romans, and give examples of the way in which, in remarkably similar worlds to the present day, this doctrine of humanitarian uh, intervention has been uh, 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 has been adduced. A number two, a a. It, it, it applies it, 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 the way it's expressed in a different way or in a different context. I mean, Thomas Jefferson, sort of uh, justifying the, the, the extermination, really, sort of of Native Americans, all right, he says, uh, uh, we are pursuing here the happiness of the Aboriginal inhabitants of our vicinities. Uh, but I, you know, that they were going to raise them up. It was a manifest destiny of white Christian men, and they almost all were men. I mean, to bring sort of the light sort of, of Christianity to you know, people grown in the darkness of ignorance and savage superstition. It was for their own good. That's why they were exterminating the Native Americans. You know, and a little time later, the wonderful quote from the top of the sort of 170 is a year, whatever it is, sort of uh, ago uh, now. And he observed some of these massive atrocities against the Native Americans, sort of, and he said, Part of that, uh, it was amazing the way the Americans, that's the way the Americans, could deprive the Indians of their rights and exterminate them with singular felicity, tranquility, legally, philanthropically, without shedding blood, without violating a single great principle of morality in the eyes of the world. It will be impossible, he said, to imagine the destruction of a people with more respect for the laws of humanity. For their own good, you see. They're lifting these people up. So it has been sort of uh, down through the uh, all the time. Some of these are the words that you can hear, and near enough the words which we can hear you sort of on our televisions uh, uh, at the moment in relation to Libya. You know, so I mean, we bombed Tripoli, and there may have been sort of some civilians around. We were targeting people who were associated with the regime. And what a pity, you know, that their families were there, and there were half a dozen children blown to smithereens, even though the target of the bomb wasn't there. Terrible pity, but it's for the greater good of the Libyan people. We can't stop now. We must free them from oppression and evil and violence. We must free them from violence. That's why we're bombing the fuck out of them in Tripoli and everywhere. <laughs> Again, if you look at a, 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 that sort of, look at the Middle East today, sort of in that context, and look at the arguments for humanitarian intervention, which pour forth from television news programs, always uncritically, always uncritically, you know, sort of the coverage of the Middle East for a long time has been disgraceful. 
The coverage sort of, of, since the Arab Spring, the coverage of the Middle East has been grotesquely disgraceful. There have been done apparently without any shame at all. The BBC is far, far worse than Al Jazeera, is worse than press TV, the Iranian state television. The BBC and ATM and CNN are worse sort of in their coverage of the places and far less reliable. They too fit in. Even the media have a lot of time for the BBC, a lot of time for the BBC's uh, journalism. There are a number sort of it's a, a, actually I'm going to drop another name now, so a heavy name, so very, you put on a hard hat if you have one. It, it, it hits you on the head. But I remember this sort of the respect in which I held the BBC sort of greatly enhanced when there's a Libya. Sort of going to come back, we're stuck sort of with a, a couple of uh, people in a journalistic enterprise and then interviewed Gaddafi sort of in a place just south of Cert. And we were given a lift back to Tripoli, sort of in an old Russian Aleutian play with, you know, prop play with uh, propellers and so on. Wonderful experience. But we arrived sort of in Tripoli at what used to be the wheel of speed in the American, the British Air Base, sort of apart from one of the Philippines that the Americans had outside their own territory for uh, in the years after the Second World War. And we arrived there and we were picked up sort of by a senior Libyan Air Force officer, he didn't drive us uh, into town. We were being treated very, very well at the time. It was 1987, and they needed all the good publicity they could get. But when we got into the car, I said, well, I'm talking to the leader of Gaddafi, and I said, yeah, what did he tell you? Drive like that. And he switched on the BBC World Service. He says, now we hear what's really happening. BBC. You know, sort of, I thought, that's wonderful. It really is. It's a wonderful thing. I told all my BBC friends when I came back. You know, the BBC today, the BBC today covering the Middle East, covering that same country, Libya, with anybody, sort of not dealing, not talking about officers and Gaddafi's army, with anybody at all listening to it, think that's what's really happening. Isn't that a breath of fresh air and objective truth in the middle of the fog of war and propaganda? No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't, because they too are part of the consensus. They too are a part of the conventional wisdom which encloses the doctrine of humanitarian uh, uh, intervention. You see, if you look at way that, it helps to explain some of the apparent contradictions in what is actually happening in the Middle East. I mentioned earlier that you've got people like Richard Hans. They are involved in a debate or the, uh, uh, in the United States in the mainstream media about some aspects of the Libyan operation, about whether it's wise. I mean, are we not going to be shown up in the eyes of the world if we do this in Libya and meanwhile look what's happening in Syria and we're not intervening there? Isn't this a problem? Intelligent members of the ruling class are, 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 are making that argument. But sort of beneath that argument, there is, as I've said, sort of the idea that the overall purpose is a moral one. And what Haas wants is not, not to be complicated or discredited by these apparent contradictions. But actually, if you look at it in class terms, if you look at it sort of in the way the socialists ought to look at it, if you look at humanitarian uh, intervention in the face for what it is, the contradictions disappear. You know, the contradictions are seemingly obvious when you compare Libya you know, to uh, the Yemen, to Bahrain, to Saudi Arabia, to the other places on which we uh, don't intervene. I mean, sort of the fact that American guns were used I mean, to slaughter students at Sana'a University in, uh, a, a, in Yemen. The fact that in Yemen 52 people were killed in an attack, an armed attack by the forces of the state in one particular demonstration. I mean, it's easy to contrast that and say, well, if you want American help, sort of in uh, the Middle East, make sure you come from Benghazi and not from Sana'a. Or make sure you come from Benghazi and not from Bahrain, sort of where we had sort of a 3 a.m. raid by heavily armed police sort of using live ammunition from people in the center, sort of a bar raid, attempting to emulate Tahir Square sort of in uh, Cairo. And remember when everybody was saying, this is wonderful in Cairo, this will be an example to the rest sort of the Middle East, that the revolution is going to spread, tyrants are going to fall. Isn't it absolutely wonderful? Well, no, it's not absolutely wonderful if you're in the White House or if you're an executive of one of the major oil companies, it's not. It's not very uh, a, a welcome development at all. As you see, sort of, and of course we know that not only 
that the forces of the dictatorship in Bahrain to slaughter their own people for demanding a uh, democracy. When they were hard pressed, they asked for and got the Saudi Arabian army to roll into their country. They're carrying Western supplied guns and American tanks backed up by American supplied Apache helicopters. They're riding across the border in order to suppress people who were asking for the same democratic rights as have been asked for by the people uh, in Tahrir Square. So if there you have sort of the main idea, on the face of it, I mean a contradiction which is very difficult for the Americans and anybody else to resolve. Same sort of applied in a slightly different way. In a slightly different way to Syria today, where there's no intervention, they say they're overstretched. They're all the geopolitical strategic reasons why they wouldn't intervene rather than Syria. But you can't see, when you look at all you isn't that a contradiction? And so forth. But if you look at it in a different way, if you look at it in the sense that the overall purpose sort of of the American and Western and NATO intervention, sort of in Libya and the rest of the region over recent weeks and months. You see sort of that it's not humanitarian at all. Far from it. That the purpose is to strengthen and tighten the control of Western economic and political influence over the entire region. Therefore, of course, you can't stand for democracy over the entire region, even in uh, Egypt, sort of as, sort of in Bahrain, sort of as in Yemen, the slogans under which people fought were not anti-Western. They weren't anti-Western at all. I mean, I imagine somewhat to the disappointment of many people in this hall, when they sort of watched what was happening in Egypt, they must have thought they heard uh, you know, people say, we want Western values and all the rest of it. Some of us must have said, fuck, I mean, that's not going well, is it, sort of, that they're, uh, this is not what we expect from a, an objectively anti-imperialist force, but the reasons for that, uh, as we all know, it wasn't anti-Western rhetoric. There was no anti-Western rhetoric really coming from people in Bahrain. There was very little that I've detected in any sort of the international news media coming uh, a, from the Yemen. People were just asking for freedom. They were asking for democratic rights. When their spokespersons came to be interviewed on Western media, they were saying, we want democracy the same as you have. And still, they're not supported sort of by the West. Still, there's no bombing. He's made far from it. In Yemen, US special forces are still active in the country backing up the regime. They have intervened in Yemen. They've been there for a long time. They're killing people in Yemen in order to sustain the very regime which is denying the democratic rights that they say they support in Egypt and Tunisia and now that they say they're using bombs to bring about uh, in Libya. You see, but if you see all that as part of sort of an overall plan, which it doesn't have to be worked out all that carefully in the minds of the US and the Western ruling classes, they just know you can't have democracy across the region. Because one of the things about democracy, if it's real democracy, is that it's very difficult to control. You have democracy and allow people to vote. There's no telling what they do. You know, sort of in Palestine after all, in January 2006, after for years telling the Palestinian people, you know, you've got to behave properly in a democratic way, you can't be wrong with all these terrorists and the mass and so on. You must have elections, the same as we have, if you're going to have a government that we respect and accept. So the people voted, and wonder of wonders, they voted a majority for Hamas. Now, within 24 hours, literally 24 hours, and incidentally, it wasn't a fraudulent election, nobody was intimidated. The European Union's fact-finding mission, it monitors all over the country, it was chaired by a British Tory MEP, you know, and he said afterwards, we find no examples of intimidation or voter spread. No examples. You certainly couldn't say that of Northern Ireland, you know, after an election. You know, there's no voter fraud going on in Saudi Arabia, here and there. But despite that, the reaction of this, Tony Blair within 24 hours says we're not recognizing this government, we're imposing sanctions on them. The cheap of the people, sort of voting for people that the West disapproved of. You see, if you allow democracy, and that type, you're in danger of that type of thing, how we can't control the situation. So and that is why, sort of when the West approaches this region, sort of this region which is fantastically rich in resources that are vital to Western capitalist economies, sort of Saudi Arabia, has aptly been described as the greatest prize in history, the oil reserves of, Sa of Saudi Arabia. So, so he's in control some places by directly subsidizing and arming dictators, as they do, and that's the simplest way of doing it. No messing. 
And he gets to get a guy to kill anybody who stands in your way, throw them in prison, torture journalists and all the rest of it. That's very simple. It works for long times, actually, in Egypt and so forth. But if that's not uh, a doable, so that then you put yourself at the head, if you can, of democratic and popular movements, try to restrain them, hold them back, divert them, direct them, and all the rest of it, which is exactly what they are doing now in Egypt with some success. You see, that in the last couple of days, the Egyptian authorities, despite everything uh, that has happened, has declared that they won't allow free passage for the freedom flotilla heading for Gaza and in collaboration with the Greek government. Isn't that interesting? The Greek government, sort of at all, sort of the turmoil and travails that the Greek uh, political elite is going through at the moment, they still have time that they stop it and intervene sort of against the freedom flotilla going to Gaza. How important must that be? How important is it to Greece? Not very important, is it? But it's important to those who support Israel. A child could work out what is happening there. That's how vital it is to them. Uh, okay. And that's how vital it is to them, and how vital it has always been down through uh, uh, the years. And we could go on sort of again, but I've been told to shut up uh, rather uh, uh, soon. But, uh, we could go on down through the years taking example uh, after example, and it's not difficult to demonstrate the contradictions and prove on the face of it the immediate hypocrisies involved. What does he say what socialists have to do and what people that are here against imperial adventures have to do is to understand the overarching rationale for all this and to understand both historically and in the present day sort of what sort of the purpose, the objective purpose if you will, of the doctrine of humanitarian uh, intervention. It is always, always about justifying exploitation and slaughter. It is never about anything else. The greatest example in history it just comes to me earlier in the week is, of course, Leopold of the Benjamins in the tail end of the 19th century. It's a wonderful book, uh, uh, Leopold's Ghost, written by Adam Hunlock, is that right? Somebody on your side. Wonderful book, which I recommend to everybody, which is about Leopold of the Benjamins and his actions in uh, the Congo. And an interesting little nexus, actually, yeah, of uh, it, the way humanitarian intervention can work across continents and so forth. It's not generally known. That Leopold of the Belgians was, in the last couple of decades of the 19th century, was the president of the World Anti-Slavery Federation. <laughs> he had decorations. He did a big ceremony in Brussels. It's described in sort of a Leopold's ghost. So where ambassadors and various emissaries and crown heads and so on gathered together in a most splendid ceremony to inaugurate Leopold as the president of the World Anti-Slavery uh, Federation or Association, whatever uh, uh, it was. You now when he appeared in loud applause and speech after speech, lauding Leopold for the great work he was doing against slavery in the world, particularly in the Congo. Uh, in the Congo, of course, what was happening is that Leopold's forces were mutilating, maiming, and massacring people, rings around them, in order to seize and keep control of, uh, again, sort of a resource-rich uh, region. And enslaving people. You know, and actually, the cook, uh, 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 the Benjamin colony, uh, the colony started in the Congo, was unique in this respect, in that it was taken over as the personal property of King Leopold. Not just as a dependency sort of ruled by Benjamin government and the Benjamin monarchy, but the whole country as the personal property of Leopold, and therefore he could decide what was to be done with the people. And I won't go into it, but anybody who knows anything about the history of colonialism in Africa, I know sort of that it was one of the most horrendous and stomach churning episodes in all history. So that I won't try to boil anybody's blood by going into it. I was saying that what was Leopold's explanation of why he could simultaneously be the leader of the anti-slavery movement in the West, while at the same time ordering and presiding over the cruel enslavement of people in another country. What was the rationale that he offered? It's very interesting that he was saving the Congolese people from Arab slavers. He was saving them from slavery. That's what he won all the awards for. You know, so, so there you have perhaps in history the most grotesque example of the doctrine of humanitarian intervention and the fact that it's uncontested at home that nobody's allowed to argue about it. It's so vital to the ruling class of the state. That argument is the most grotesque example of it. And actually one of the interesting sort of ancillary stories to that whole sort of disgusting saga is sort of the fact that in Ireland, remember when they were trying to dragoon the Irish people into supporting the First World War and trying to recruit, as they managed to do, 
tens of thousands of young Irish people into the British Army to go and fight against the Hun and, uh, and all that. Now we might know now, and no serious historian challenges. There is the suggestion that actually the First World War was fought between two empires for the right to you know, rule the waves and rob the world. That's what it was about, but that's not the way it was presented at the time, of course. It was presented in Ireland as an effort to save little Catholic Belgium. And this was used, that phrase was used over and over again to a Catholic people, of course. And the Catholic bishops and priests were out in the stump saying that the Catholic Belgium nuns are being raped and uh, uh, Belgium as the army of the Huns, very few of whom were decent Catholics themselves, that were coming across uh, the North German plains, are going to slaughter people in Belgium. We've got to go and rescue our fellow Catholics. So there's humanitarian intervention to save a country which is enslaving other people whose king was the president of the World Anti-Slavery uh, Federation. Justifying all this, the doctrine is all about humanitarianism. Now why is this vital? Why is this so vital to the British ruling class at the moment? Why is it so vital that, that William Hague is going on television and promising that unlimited resources are going to be provided at a time of austerity to pursue uh, this particular operation. Well, the reason for it is this, it seems to me, so that no ruling class can maintain itself in power at home unless it has the support of the majority, and hopefully of the vast majority in their point of view, the vast majority for its adventures abroad. Now, this is as old as Marx. Marx wrote this, rather than used the example of Ireland extensively. Started when he was writing, started with the key to the impotence, sort of, of the British proletariat lay in the way that they backed their own rulers against the Irish. And they backed their own rulers against the Irish again, because the Irish were presented to them as savage people. They were killing one another, they had no culture, and all the rest of it. Sort of, they had to be saved, they had to be lifted up. It was being done for their own good. It was a humanitarian intervention. There have been the marks sort of wrote about the way that, particularly you know, in northern towns of Manchester and Liverpool, there are in the Midlands and Birmingham and so on, he described in some detail the way in which that divided the working class, the way in which Irish immigrant workers in those places were held in contempt with hatred by large sections of the British working class because they've been given there have been all this propaganda about them, and also that they have been recruited to the patriotic, British patriotic position of backing our boys over trying to save the Simeon Irish from themselves. So, so it's worked everywhere. It worked everywhere. And it's necessary for it to work out. They, they work for this to be adduced in order for foreign adventures to work. See, despite everything, the last public opinion poll by the Pew organization, which seems to be very highly regarded in these matters, public opinion survey of the United States, showed that 51% just over a majority of people were opposed to the intervention in Libya. Despite everything, they were opposed uh, to it. And yet, Obama has to sort of attach himself to it, to play some role in it, even if it's a little behind the British eh, and the French, because the strategic and economic interests of the United States and of the major companies, particularly of course oil companies, sort of are engaged in that region. He has to do it, and has to have support to do it. They can't survive. They cannot survive if the mass of the people see through what they are at in terms of uh, a foreign adventure and rise up against them. The anti-war movement represented the vast uh, the majority of people, not only in terms of the answer to public opinion polls, but in organized militant array. Then, that would mean that they had proven with their own ruling class in relation to these uh, adventures abroad. And if they break with their own ruling class on those vital interests of the ruling class, then, they have begun to break with the ruling class generally. What explains, what explains the doctrine of humanitarian intervention? What explains the fact that it is necessary, that it is vital to ruling classes everywhere, to going back to Rome, coming through the Crusades, coming to the dawn sort of, of capitalism, to the colonization of America, the extermination of the Native American people, and you could go on, wars over the Philippines, the United States, the war with the Spanish over Cuba, all those wars, every single one, First World War, there are all of them, every the worst slaughters in human history, all of them have been justified by the doctrine of humanitarian uh, intervention. And every occasion it has been a lie. It has been a lie perpetrated by murderers, liars, 
frauds, robbers, and thieves, that is to say, by the ruling class. A life that is perpetrated by them in order to secure the allegiance, usually under a patriotic flag, of course, in order to secure the allegiance of their own of the mass of the people. It follows from this immediately, it seems to me, that they oppose fully and full wholeheartedly the doctrine of appeal of a humanitarian intervention, and to take it to its logical conclusion, it is necessary to confront the class society in which you are born and in which you are laboring. It is necessary, if you're never going to be free, to win sort of the full value of your labor from the ruling class, from the system. Now, you're never going to be able to do that when you attach yourself to your own ruling class in its foreign adventures. It cannot be done with key to Marx's understanding of that sort of in the middle of the last century. It is key to understanding the hypocrisy over Libya and over the Middle East generally today. There is that inextricable and intimate link between fighting against imperial, imperialist wars abroad, however they are presented, fighting against imperialist wars abroad on the one hand, and fighting for the rights and interests of the working class at home. In other words, we should contest, challenge, denounce and destroy the doctrine of humanitarian intervention, not just because, although this would be a sufficient reason on its own, not just because in denouncing it and challenging it, we'll be going some way to coming to the assistance of people abroad who need our assistance, it is also vital in our own interest too, in the interest of the progress of their own class. We must do it for ourselves. The humanitarian intervention sir, is the great lie, the great lie which all ruling classes spread in order to justify the slaughter of people who stand in their way. Decency, if nothing else, demands that we reject it, challenge it, and defeat it. Thanks very much.